So, so yes, that's kind of to put it in, put it into context. So, first identified in December 2019. Obviously, this graph is for the UK, so that's way off here. More than 15.7 million cases across 188 countries and territories. So, yes, definitely a pandemic, as declared on the 11th of March, which is right, right at the beginning here of of, um, of this chart of numbers. And 23rd of March, lockdown began in the UK. Okay, so this was around, it probably was as lockdown began that we started thinking about this paper and putting things together. So, so around, around this point. So as everyone's aware, it's had such a profound impact on everything um, this year. Um, and, and that was really the context in which we were, we were starting to think about it. Okay. So the basis for the talk is a paper that we put together. Um, the aim of the paper was to identify kind of challenges raised by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, to identify these challenges and also to elaborate on them a little bit more. Now the paper was published in the Journal of Simulation, so we have focused on more of the challenges that would be met by simulation rather than others which may be better met by other parts of operational research and, and optimization ideas etc so there's there's definitely things that we don't have in here um, the other thing to say about it is it was it was kind of meant to be a call to arms in some ways so here's what we can we've identified Here's where we think that we can have an impact. Um, here's as well some relevant research in that area that, that might be useful. Um, and so it, it acts in some ways as a guide, if you like, as to how simulation modeling, as I said in this case, could help support informed decisions. So this was how, how we'd set it up. So currently it's had uh, more than 12,000 views which for an academic paper is um, something, yes, you don't see very often in OR papers. So that's, that's been brilliant. It clearly arrived at the right moment um, and captured various people's imagination. I, I say views rather than read, so I don't know how many of them actually actually read it, but, <laughs> but 12,000 people have looked at it. Um, and many thanks as well to Taylor and Francis, who are the OR Society publishers who have made most of their COVID-19, or I think pretty much all of the COVID-19 um, papers free to access, which has been great. I mean, there's been such an explosion in, um, in work that's out there and the fact that it's free to access is, is brilliant. So that has been, has been really useful. So before going on to the, um, on to the next part where I actually start talking about some of the things that we discussed and came up with. I wanted just to pause a little bit and talk about the new ways of working. So as I said, this started at, right at the beginning of um, lockdown and we'd just been sent home from our offices. I think um, John Fowler in the US was a little bit behind, so I think he could actually talk from his, from his office at the time we were having these meetings. Um, so it was getting to used to these new ways of working. By now they've become, I think everyone's got a bit more habituated to them, so they're, they're, they're not quite as novel. But at the time, kind of sat there at nine o'clock in the evening, because most of our meetings were at nine o'clock in the evening. Many of us were homeschooling during the day and um, trying to balance everything else and obviously competing demands from students, etc. So nine o'clock in the evening was the time that worked for us and also fitted with John in the US. Um, this guy kind of sat at my kitchen table, live editing a Google Doc with several other people also contributing to it whilst on a video call was an amazing experience actually, it was great. It was quite exciting and just made you realise that you don't actually need to be in the same place to work together. The video conferencing and so forth has, um, has been proved itself to work. It's not quite the same as being um, being face to face, but it, it, it's, it's almost there. So we found that, that very interesting and also starting to think about how that would impact 
on different ways of working and Kathy and, and Taylor particularly interested in the conceptual modeling and group model building and these kind of ideas, how you do that virtually and what extra challenges that raises is quite an interesting question. I don't think, I think there's more scope for research there and they're certainly keen to look at those areas. Um, yeah, but probably didn't lend itself to good night's sleep necessarily with these, these late nights spent editing papers, but it, it was worth it. Um, actually, one more thing I would say on this, which I think is important, is um, is in some ways the video conferencing has helped with people who wouldn't normally travel. And I kind of, I, I do travel, but having family commitments and so forth, it's that little bit harder to make the time and to be able to go away and have these face-to-face um, -face contacts with people to travel to the other side of the world or the other side of the country even requires quite a lot more organisation sitting on a video call is quite straightforward and I've actually found during lockdown there's more of these meetings that I've been able to get to because the I can sit there in in my house and do it and don't need to to travel away so I think it has opened things up for some people who wouldn't otherwise have um, been able to make it so it's not been definitely not been all good but there have been some positives associated with it. So okay, let's get to what we actually talked about in the paper. So I think that's the, the interesting bit with where the OR kind of stuff came in. Um, and what we started doing, and very much helped by Antoela and Kathy, who are brilliant at kind of leading these discussions and get getting things um, getting things moving and getting people talking, we started to think about what the key decisions would be. Um, and as soon as we started thinking about that, you think about how should we actually classify these decisions. So what we were looking at for classifying the decisions was one thing was geographic scope. So by geographic scope, we mean is this a, a kind of decision that is global that's going to affect the whole world? Is this a particular question that may affect a country or a small part of the country? So in the US, maybe a state in the UK, maybe Wales, Scotland, for example, um, or is it um, organisational level, or is it at the individual level? So actually, just looking at individuals moving through things. So that was one way we were classifying them. The other way was to think about the timing and where they would fit within the pandemic. And I think at this bit, in some ways, we were possibly naive, possibly hopeful, thinking about COVID nineteen as almost an emergency management. So we looked at the disaster response phases for coming up with, or emergency management phases for, for coming up with these timing classifications. So thinking of it as preparedness, response and recovery. What I think we actually also need um, is another phase, which has become more evident as we go through it, is kind of management and the new normal. So kind of following on from the recovery from where the peak was at its worst to how is this actually going to change things as we move forward for the next five years. So, and I, I guess back in March, maybe we were, weren't thinking, thinking so far ahead about that. Um, yeah, and that's my health warning. This was what seemed important in March. We now know a bit more about what's going on. Um, so the decisions I'll go through uh, in the next few slides, so I'm not going to kind of go through that list of 11 that are there because you'll see them again over the next next several slides. Um, the colours on here, because we were, this was in the journal of simulation, we were focusing on these simulation decisions was really to think about what kind of modelling techniques would be most beneficial for these different, um, different decisions we were making. So that's what the pretty colours do. And Duncan did this amazing graph, um, which shows how everything fits together and what kind of modeling techniques would be useful. There were many, and you can see um, 11, I think, health and well-being, where we've got most of the colors of the rainbow in there, and social distancing, for example. Aspects of social distancing could work with a discrete event simulation model, 
could be modeled with a system dynamics model, could be modeled with an agent-based model, could be modeled with a hybrid model. And so in some, some cases, and in fact many, there's more than one modeling technique that could be used dependent on the exact question that you're asking. So that's why some of them have um, multiple colors. And I think none of them have just one color. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So the other way we classified them was on kind of general topics, and this is how we talked about them. So the first was um, disease transmission. We're looking at disease transmission. Um, and decision one was looking at quarantine strategies and case isolation. As I say, this was March, so we were this was you know uppermost in everybody's everybody's heads at the time. So reducing transmission from known positive cases and between countries. And I think when you're looking at these ideas, a lot of this is coming out in the applied maths um, uh, literature as well. So the mathematical um, epidemiology and infectious disease, disease modeling. So people like Neil Ferguson and so forth and in his group at Imperial had lots of ideas on this. Um, and what I'll do as I go through this is kind of come up with, well, look at what I've found in the OR literature of papers and things which have been and um, work, relevant work, which looks like it's been solving this problem. So decision two was social distancing measures. Um, and if you remember back to what we were told at the beginning of March or middle of March, really, the initial aim of these was to flatten the curve to allow the health service to cope with the volume of cases. So that was why we were put into lockdown. That was why the schools were closed and everything else was shut, was we need to flatten the curve so that we don't get to overwhelm the hospitals with the volume of cases. Um, and this is where, at that point, given how, where we were and how little we knew about the, the disease and what the short time scale was really for coming up with these type of models. Some of these simple kind of scratch models, I think Kaplan uses scratch to describe them, um, are very useful for estimating the effect of social distancing on demand in this case for ICU beds. And this was um, an example from the US, um, which Ed Kaplan Come, came up with and there's a very nice paper that talks about these scratch models and how they were how they were built um, to estimate what the demand would be under certain conditions um, and he was talking about you know if for his particular university should we allow graduation to go ahead should we limit the numbers to 100 to 50 to 25 and in the end I think it was cancelled um, so they have these quite interesting uh, idea of having these simple models that can be easily fitted to different situations. Um, there's some similar work that is about to be published in the Journal of Simulation for the UK by um, Simon Taylor and his group, a group in Brunel that builds an agent-based model um, and looks at how the health service copes. And I know that there are various people around the, around the kind of healthcare OR area who've been doing this kind of building these these relatively straightforward models to estimate what we need to do to keep keep the health service allow the health service to keep up and also to estimate how much time is being used within the health service um decision three was probably kind of looking ahead hopefully at that point but um it's something that's still ongoing in many countries, especially the UK now, is managing the end of lockdown. And I guess knowing when we have got to the end of lockdown and, and have we got there yet, we've eased a lot of the restrictions, but there's definitely still a lot quite in place. So how to relax social distancing without causing the infamous second peak. And at the moment, we're seeing this kind of rises in various countries across Europe. So this is certainly a worry at the moment. Um, have we opened up too quickly? How do we actually um, actually cope with these extra numbers? Mm -hmm. um, so I talk here about fire breaks and bubbles. So this was very interesting. I've got obviously colleagues in Southampton who are in um, applied math. Um, one of them invited me to one of the 
virtual knowledge exchange for the mathematical sciences um, groups. Um, Miguel Andros was there as well, and he was one of the people kind of leading this, so may have more to, more to say on this later. But the aim of this um, online workshop, and it was fully online, all on Zoom, lots of discussions, um, splits into discussion groups, use of online tools such as Mural to be moving things around and annotating and um, adding in these, you know, live editing of these documents. So really it's quite exciting um, couple of days. The aim of this was to see how we could get um, the country back to work and in a safe way. Um, and there were some really interesting ideas there and it was nice having that interplay with some people from OR, some people from Applied Math and kind of on the, the borderline and, and sharing ideas. So this was, this was great. So they kind of talked about fire breaks and bubbles and bubbles have certainly become prevalent everywhere, kind of keeping people within their bubbles um, so that you can reduce, kind of keep into small communities. Okay. A final one then on, um, well, a final couple, I think, on disease transmission. One is delivery of, of testing. Um, and this is an interesting paper by Arida L, which I found in Health Systems, which was, again, published fairly early. So it was more of a conceptual framework to overcome problems with testing, such as shortages of testing kits, which was a real issue at the beginning of the epidemic. Um, limited number of, of healthcare staff and long delays. So I've kind of quoted from this because obviously this isn't my work just to see what they were doing. Um, so the effectiveness of testing sites to quickly identify suspected cases and confirm the disease depends on allocating resources. So testing kits and healthcare staff at the right place with the right amount and at the right time. So effective supply chain management execution of these operations can influence epidemic dynamics and reduce the burden of the disease in the community. So this is really emphasizing the importance of all these things that OR does in terms of resource management, um, supply chain management, and the efficient running of these test centers. So we have, um, and this is a picture that I've took from the paper where you have this registration and everyone's in their cars and this is what we saw in the IKEA car park again right at the beginning. Um, I suspect this will change, we're not going to be having so much of these cars arriving at um, big shopping centres to have their testing done and certainly at Southampton we're trialling a saliva test for, um, for testing which is much more straightforward than the swab test. So I did this last week, I spat in a bottle first thing in the morning, have my test result back within five hours of submitting it. Um, and this kind of, kind of simple, straightforward testing, I, I would hope is the way forward. So that's my plug for Southampton um, ideas. Okay. Um, and then the fifth decision we looked at was targeted vaccination. Again, optimistic, no vaccines arrived yet, but how best to roll out vaccination across a community. Um, and building models that will look at that and will optimise the effectiveness to a certain extent of the targeted vaccination. So that's a fifth decision we considered. And I know um, Duncan has, Robertson has plans to kind of move this forward. So that was um, disease control. Looking now at resource management, so becoming, I guess, getting further away from the applied math, more to the kind of pure operational research in some ways. Decision six was, was to do with capacity of hospitals. So how do we, how should capacity be created? How should resources be managed for effective care? And we were looking at things like um, discrete event simulation models that have inputs from um, up-to-date inputs, real-time data being fed into them to see how we could then manage resources for effective care. That's what we were beginning to look at. Um, there has been some work, Exeter have been quite active on this, and um, Daniel Chalk and others 
have a paper in the BMJ that looked in particular in this case at palliative care and this end of life care, because um, clearly there's um, additional demand for it, sadly. And so using discrete event simulation for doing that. Um, there's also some interesting ideas, and this is one example, but a very good example of um, from Michael Allen, again at Exeter, of online models that are available, easy to use and easy to adapt to your organisation um, in terms of you can you just need the, some relatively simple data inputs into it, you can adapt that model. Um, it's all open source, it, it can run, um, run anywhere and I know this one's been used in, in various places to kind of look at the clinical pathways and in this case looking at optimising surgical caseload. So you can keep some of that surgery going while the COVID epidemic is, is going so you don't have such a big backlog um, when everything has started to ease up. Also looking at, um, at staffing, so identifying the number of staff needed, the support they need um, to allow fast return to work, testing strategies to allow them to get back to work whether there's additional need for mental health, et cetera. So this was another decision that we identified. I've not found any work on that so far, but um, it's possibly on its way. And then the eighth decision was management of regional resources. So looking at optimizing distribution networks to account for jumps in demand, geographical variations. So this is remembering um, the PPE, the toilet roll, the bread flour, the yeast shortages. Um, I mean, obviously, in terms of the health of the nation, probably the PPE was the most relevant from there, but it was certainly one of the talks um, in March uh, was very much around what you couldn't get in the shops. Um, And then in terms of our split into different areas of um, different kind of topic areas, if you like, care was the last one that we looked at. Um, and decision nine was admission and discharge. So how do you decide? And this is obviously up to the medical doctors to a certain extent because it has to be based on the patient need, but you're looking at admission of um, patients into either your hospital or your ICU department and then discharge of patients out. And this was kind of well publicized that there was a large scale discharge of patients fairly um, to prepare for that expected and surge in um, patients suffering from COVID-19. So that happened fairly early, early on. And then sadly, this rationing of care in extremists, obviously we didn't want to be doing that all the time and quick discharge where possible. And there's been lots about this at the, at the time. There's a, this wasn't a paper, but just a link to a blog from Christina Pagel, who's been very active um, on independent stage and has, it's been great to see her in the news and various places kind of banging the drum for this kind of thing. Um, she has an interesting model about triaging effectively in a pandemic and this is kind of bringing in lots of different OR ideas I think to that really horrible question of who how you decide who to admit into an ICU so thinking about length of stay survival rates etc but particularly that length of stay within the um, within the ICU so thinking that uh, for an ICU the scarce resources are bed days and ventilated time so you need to take account of that, the time that somebody is going to be within those, within that ICU or on that ventilator when you're deciding, um, when you're doing your triaging. Um, fortunately, those days are, seem to be behind us, but that, that was quite an interesting, interesting blog. And it's great that these are appearing in things like the BMJ rather than, so they're much more widespread and reaching, reaching that big audience. Um, so decision 10 was minimizing the impact on other patients. 
So balancing this impact on the wider health service with the immediate need of COVID-19. So you can see all these COVID-19 patients coming in, but you've obviously got these other patients who are waiting for the various um, procedures to take place and seeing how can you kind of balance the impact of the two. Um, this is an interesting paper by Richard Wood. This was published in the Journal of Simulation about a month ago. Um, and Richard works for one of the NHS trusts, I forget which one, but he's been looking, at, he looked at modeling the impact of COVID-19 on elective waiting times um, and how it's gonna pan out over the next um, two plus years in terms of returning to um, elective waiting times that look like the ones we had at the beginning of 2020. Um, not the pleasantest of reading if you're work, if for anybody really, but restoring performance, I think he's discussed in his paper, which uses a, a relatively straightforward simulation model, but still very important one. Um, restoring performance could take two years, assuming that we do get these additional capacity injections of around 12 and a half percent. And in his, I mean, obviously quoting the worst case figures here, around up to 15 billion pounds um, to return us to that, to just where we were at the, at the start of the pandemic. So there's quite a lot of interesting ideas here. And I think we'll see more work in this area as to how we kind of return and how we operate um, in this new normal, as people like to call it. So the final decision on there was um, decision 11, health and well-being. Um, determining the impact of lockdown and the subsequent economic downturn on mental health at a population level and weighing up the risks of opening up and relieving economic social pressures versus remaining isolated and reducing disease transmission. And these are things which you can see the government are having to grapple with or governments around the world are having to grapple with, with constantly at the moment. We weren't looking in this at economic models as such we were, had more of a focus towards the health side so and none of us in that group had any expertise on modeling um, economic yeah the economy it, let's just put it that way and so we kind of left that to us to one side and thought about how would this actually impact on mental health at a population level and I don't think back in March we really appreciated how much of a downturn we would see. I think it was, it was hinted at, but you still think everything's gonna be all right and hopefully everything will be, it's, it's certainly not, not, not dire. Um, but looking at that impact on mental health at a population level was something that we thought was quite important. Um, but equally weighing up these risks of opening up and relieving um, social pressures against that need to reduce transmission of the disease is also something that that, oh, that simulation and, and OR in general might be able to help with. I've always thought you should, in terms of opening up, you kind of rank, you need in some ways to rank your activities in terms of which are most important to society as a whole and the, and the economy and go through that rank list until you get to a point where opening up the next one is going to um, raise your risk too high. Um, but yes, we obviously can't see everything that's going on. And as operational researchers, we are informing the decisions rather than making them, I guess is the other thing to say. So that's what came up in the discussions that we had. We were obviously, as I said, taking that view, looking at it through a lens of the simulation modeler. What else has come up? So. One other thing that's, that's arisen, and I'm also kind of doing this search while preparing this talk, um, this area also seemed to be important, was data analytics and information systems. So they've been vital and there's been a lot of work and the number of um, data dashboards on what the epidemic is doing is, is multiplied incredibly quickly. Um, and there have been some, there's a, special issue out in EGIS, European Journal of Information Systems, again, no our society journal, that's why I took a good close look at that. Um, and these are two papers that are out so far 
on this kind of area. So one, looking at which data dashboards have been most effective. Um, so that's quite interesting. It wasn't something I'd thought about initially as a question, but clearly it is very important to work out you know, which ones actually help with making decisions. Um, and then this other aspect, which has been quite important, this misinformation that's come out, you know, these um, strange rumours that 5G is going to is cause coronavirus and all these, these other strange rumours that come out that um, would count as this misinformation, stuff that undermines official advice and appears on social media. So looking at how that spreads, how it works, how it can be counted in particular, it seems like an, another important problem that's out there. So it's good that people are looking at that. Um, and then again, kind of going through what's been published, there's a special issue out in Journal of the OR Society now, um, which is from, I think, Mike Carter, Paul Harper, and Konstantinos. Papsicopoulos um, and maybe Sally Brailsford as well. I forget whether I haven't got her written on my name, but I'm sure she's involved. Um, so looking at healthcare behaviour in OR. So how do patients and staff behaviours alter the effectiveness of interventions? And when you think of something like lockdown um, and these kind of whether people were wearing masks or not, these kind of behaviours, there's a lot of behavioural um, ideas in there. So having these techniques also seems seems vital and incorporating that behavioural aspect into models um, can make them better, I think. So that's a, it looks like a fascinating special issue. But I haven't had a chance to read through in detail, but it looks, it looks like there's lots of good stuff in there. So coming on to um, kind of the conclusion, almost conclusions and ways forward for this, these are my two kind of more technical kind of thoughts on how can OR best support decisions. So the first is this important one about communicating uncertainty in model results. So this is particularly true if you have something like a stochastic simulation model where the output is different every time you run it. Um, you're going to have a lot of uncertainty that's inherent in the model coming through. Um, but in any model, that you, um, that you build, be it an optimization model or a simulation model, you've got some uncertainty on, to do with what you're putting in as input. And I think having that uncertainty, carrying through that uncertainty and explaining that uncertainty to someone you are talking to is quite important. And David Spiegel, a very well-known statistician, talks about this quite a lot. How do you communicate this uncertainty in the model results in a way that makes it understandable? To, um, to people. So I think that's something that, that is vital. Uh, and people have been doing, I'm not saying this is something new, people have been doing this for years, so this is just a, um, something to continue doing, doing well. Um, what came up when we were discussing the simulation paper in particular was, was this need for rapid development of conceptual models of, and this ability to see the problem, build a model and get it out there and, and then start adapting with it and playing with it as you go through seems quite important. And these ideas that I talked about with Ed Kaplan, for example, his scratch models and the Python models that we talked about that are all open source and people can look at, um, this will help with that, I think, this rapid development of, um, of conceptual models. So those are my two kind of big, big things. Obviously, keep doing good OR is, is a key one as well, and that falls into it. But those are the particular things which seemed important in this example. And then this was thinking more of community ideas and something that we that we talked about quite a lot um, on these late night um, late night video calls was how can OR actually play maybe a bigger part in these key decisions on COVID-19, but also on anything which is important to the um, to society. So the, the first one is bring the community together. These are all people from Southampton on, I think it was a Teams call we had a couple of months back. Everyone looks very happy, which is obviously important. Um, 
So bringing the community together is, is one of those, those key things. How do you get that grouping together and know what expertise is in different places? Um, which hopefully things like the OR30 research panel will do for an, from an academic perspective to kind of be able to respond quickly to these ideas. Um, I've also put there engage with the whole mathematics community. I think that's important that we keep up those links with statistics um, and applied math. Uh, in particular, who are looking at, at similar ideas and are very much on the borderline of, of what we're doing. It's a, it's a fuzzy boundary between, between these communities. And then I will give Kathy this, the, um, the credit for this idea of something like a virtual, virtual Bletchley. So can we have this kind of virtual center of expertise that will answer these important questions? So, Virtual Betsy is what I put here. There's also something you could think of like the, well, that has been done, this National COVID-19 Operational Research Network, or ENGHORN, which um, Martin Pitt is organising, which is looking very much at, at more healthcare um, issues associated with, with COVID-19. Um, and then engaging with policymakers, again, something we do, so not not saying we've never done this before, but just kind of re-emphasizing this shout about the importance of OR. And what's clear is that OR will be needed in what this, the new normal, what follows as we kind of gradually um, come away from, from this pandemic and live with, with what's happened over the past, past three to six months. Um, so engaging with policymakers is, is definitely definitely important. As I say, it's good to see things like Christina Pagel on the independent stage kind of fighting in some ways for these OR type ideas um, being used. So that's all I wanted to say. I'm happy to have questions now from anybody. I don't know whether how Gavin would like to do it. I'm happy to, for people to unmute and ask a question or we can put questions in the comments. Um, either way. We've got a hand raising function. Can we use that, Gavin? Yeah, sure. Um, Christine, you'll need to stop sharing your screen so that we can see folk. Yeah. If people want to unmute and ask a question, feel free to do so or, or try waving and I'll try and bring you in. Uh, we haven't got unmanageable numbers. Janet, go ahead. Right. Well, congratulations, first of all, Christine. Uh, I think you were there at the right time. And, uh, and to have over 12,000 views of that paper is fantastic and will hopefully help, help our income model in uh, publications going forward. Um, I think the important thing is, is what you said at the end about shouting out about the importance of OR. Because I'm hearing modelling and the science everywhere. But I've never heard one policymaker mention operational research in their modelling. I was wondering, could you comment on that? Yeah, I think you're right. And I think um, if you look back at what was happening initially and what the people involved with SAGE, a lot of it was applied mathematicians looking at, at disease models, which they do brilliantly. So I'm not saying that's, that's not a good thing. But you needed in some ways to have that operational viewpoint as to what what's feasible what could be done kind of resource management these ideas and i think if we'd had that at the beginning then things like the ppe um shortages and um the testing kit shortages maybe there would have been been something more we could have done it's just how we get in there and and make the case for or being important and being at the table if you like on those discussions i think is uh, it's something that I don't know exactly how it should be done without a lot of a lot of shouting. So if, <laughs> I think if you have any ideas, that would be um, that would be great. Because I think that's the important thing is kind of being in there and being able to access those those decision makers really. Yeah. So perhaps I can just say something thing here, Christine. We we are. Um, since the beginning of this year, we've had a program of engaging with policymakers 
and, and, and politicians. Uh, part of that is the uh, invitation to Chris Skidmore to give the Blackett Lecture. We invited him when he was university's minister. Um, and uh, th th this is something, it, it, it got slowed down by, by COVID, but we are um, uh, moving that to a, a virtual program now, moving it online. Um, and you know, I'd really, really welcome a discussion with you as, as to how, you know, if, if, you, if you'd be interested in inputting to that and, uh, and coming along to one or two of the meetings, then let's, uh, let's talk about it. Yeah, that sounds great, Edmund. I think that kind of thing is really important. The other thing which um, has kind of been, again, as slightly derailed by, um, by COVID is things like the ideas behind an Academy of Mathematics in which the OR Society and other um, applied maths and statistical societies are involved, may be involved in. This is very, very early days. So, so that, that, is, that, 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 that is ongoing. Again, it, it, it was derailed a little bit by COVID. Uh, one of the uh, meetings that we had in the early days pre-COVID uh, with, with Philip Bond, uh, the, the, the author of the Bond Review, uh, highlighted the uh, importance of an academy. And indeed, I have just uh, um, agreed to a, a meeting with the five CMS presidents and EPSRC to discuss how to take this forward. Uh, unfortunately, that, that meeting did, did land on, on one of the days of the, of the conference. So I've, uh, I'm going to have to uh, uh, miss, miss one of the days of the conference to attend that meeting. But that is, that is happening in the background. It will continue to happen. Um, and it, it's just moving virtually now. That, of course, will be a virtual meeting. Yeah, yeah. So I think all of these things will help to kind of raise the profile and, and keep us keep us there. Yeah. So I think that's important. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Graham's waving. Graham Rand. Yeah, it's, it's not so much a question, but uh, just to follow up that discussion, uh, after your um, suggestion that we were request that we shout about OR, you can hardly refuse my invitation to contribute an article along this topic for the Impact magazine. But the, the important thing, of course, once you've done that, is that the, uh, the society disseminates it to the policy makers that Edmund is talking about. So that we, we've got to join this up and, and get the message uh, out that OR is alive and well and can do something very useful. Absolutely, I, I agree. Yeah. I think an, an interesting aspect to this is at what point do we do we get to hear about or or learn what the government OR people have been up to? No doubt they've been heavily involved, but as outsiders, we haven't really seen that yet. And I'm sure there's lots of interesting stuff. Um, so it'll be great when we get to the point where hopefully they're able to share. Um, what they have been doing and what they've contributed and, and we can shout about that too yeah yeah and also what they they didn't have that they might have needed so i think from an academic point of view kind of knowing what it would have been useful for them to have at the beginning of the pandemic would be a really interesting kind of set of questions for us in terms of what modeling tools did they not have that they wish they had had and um and how we could help in that in that way because i think we're, we're very keen to help it's just kind of being able to channel it, channel it in the right direction is important gavin, gavin it's uh, alan, alan robinson just just to build on that the, the, clearly the analysts within government have been doing a lot of work sometimes as you say that's difficult to share while we're in the middle of these things but very keen to follow up on some of these things once we're allowed to talk a little bit more about some of the activities that we've been engaged with um, through SAGE and other groups because uh, I think there's a there's a lot of conversations to be had around that that space and the, the analysts within government have been quite influential through all of this the, the, there's always an interesting balance because we tend to try and talk analysis at government level because frankly, we don't want them to worry whether it's an OR person, an economist or a statistician or a psychologist who's best placed to answer, answer the question. So we tend to talk about analysis or science at that level, but we still need to get the, the message out that OR is a key contribution to that. And certainly through the government OR service, we, we have had a significant voice through some of that. And 
yeah, we'll tell some of the tales in slower time. Excellent, excellent. Just wanted to, to follow up on that. Um, if you know anyone from government, from central government, that would be willing to talk about health modeling in OR at the OR 62 conference, I would be really keen to hear if you could message me. I would really appreciate that. But specifically on health modeling, because we're organizing the health stream and we're organizing a panel there just on the topics of uh, challenges and opportunities for modeling. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Any questions? No, wouldn't appear to be. Okay, let's... No, hold on a second. Max, are you trying to come in? You're muted, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not on the seaside, that's I'm just experimenting with virtual uh, backgrounds. But um, just Christine and, and following Janet's point, if it was just one sort of example we could give about how OR has helped in the crisis, it'd be useful to sort of share that. And you know, sometimes just one example is, is better than, yeah, so fantastic to see the range of different um, activities, but be nice also to say to people, you know, this is one thing that OR has, has actually done. And obviously, perhaps with government OR as well, but I can see that that's more difficult to um, disseminate at the moment. Yeah, I think that's really important. It's kind of being able to, like you say, with the government OR analysts, they haven't yet been able to publish it and, and talk about it. I think sometimes with academia as well, if they're still right in the middle of it, like with, I think Miguel Andros just said he's off to help his university with its... Um, return post-COVID and I think a lot of us are also involved in in those kind of ideas it's often it's not got to the point where it's been published and it's been made made public yet so that's maybe something sadly that will be a few months down the line when we can, can people have got a bit more time to be able to, to say what they've done but yeah I agree having a real headline case is, would be would be great yeah definitely thanks yeah, I nearly fell off the sofa when I saw Christine Pagel on, on the on the TV, on the news, on the six o'clock news, and, and OR was actually mentioned in her title. Yeah, the Christine, that was Christine and not me. <laughs> no, no, yes. Yeah. Christine, yeah. indeed. Yeah, no, she, she, that's been great having her back. It's been a brilliant job. Janet, again? Yeah, can I just make two points? I mean, now is an ideal time. They've just announced that it's a 10-day uh, uh, isolation now for anyone who's been diagnosed with COVID. So the impact of that 10 days would be good in a, in a model uh, in popular press, if you can do that this afternoon, Christine. <laughs> uh, and also, we, we sort of start in the blame game now as well. You know, why was this done? Why was that done? And I just hope that the that the blame isn't put all on the science then, <laughs> that, uh, that there's, you know, that there's backups for, for why decisions were made. That's it. That's certainly the question about the blame thing has come up in, in meetings between learned societies. I think we're all sort of aware that we might need to react in some way if science in general is, is blamed for some of this. Are there any other questions? I, I wanted to add to that, it's not a question, that I'd written an, an article once. It was written by somebody from um, um, Australian, um, uni, from a, an Australian university. I can't remember the details, but they were explaining very well the idea of um, how should we interpret data from models because models will never give you a specific answer because there are lots of different courses of action that could take but making clear how we need to communicate the answers to the model and how we actually use what the model says in order to on decisions, it's quite something that maybe in the within the OR society community we need to address probably as part of that um, 
uh, comment that you were making, Gavin. But I, 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 if I can find that article again, I think I'd probably be a very good article to refer to. It was a blog, not a, an actual article. Sure, feel free to share, share the to link to that if you, if you find it. Yeah. Thank you. If there are no further questions, could I just take the opportunity to, 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 to thank Christine for such, a, such an outstanding talk. That really, really was uh, excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Evan, and thanks for the invite as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, right, Gavin. Sorry, well, sorry we're going. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go I'm on, mis Gavin. misinterpreting the signals. People are clapping. Ah, yeah. But, sorry, uh, I thought they were hands up. Be. I, I, I'm not sure how we clap virtually, but... Uh, so there, there is a there is a rea reaction symbol, but I've yeah. had a sudden panic. People were putting their hands up with questions. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well. Well. Uh, th 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 thanks again, Christine. Um, Gavin, can we move on to the next part? Of yeah. The so what I need to do now is to share my screen. Uh, let me see if I can do that. And. Jump into right. So hopefully now you can see my screen with a title slide. Yep, we can see that. I can see that. Can everybody else? Yep. Fabulous. Um, well, as I hinted at earlier on, uh, Edmund and I are sharing this next section. Um, so I'm going to be controlling the slides. So Edmund, uh, just shout when you want me to move forward to to the next slide. Th th thanks, Gavin. Uh, let's move on to the next slide now. Now, please. Okay, so I will just give you a very brief overview of 2019 and of course uh, it seems like a very very long time ago because it's uh, it's pre-covid and most of these highlights are uh, pre-covid highlights and the situation has dramatically changed as we all know but let, let's go through some of some of the highlights because I think uh, you know I think the society uh, uh, has been doing uh, a really really great job and, and I very much want to thank uh, all the uh, employees, uh, Gavin and his team, um, because you know I think the work that they've been doing, particularly in in in, in the COVID crisis, has been outstanding. One of the big we've already touched on this in the in the discussion following Christine's talk, but one of the uh, big uh, issues and big themes for the society and indeed for the community is the, the, the big maths initiative, the recommendations of the bond review. We, uh, in January, the Prime Minister announced uh, an extra £300 million for mathematical sciences. That's, you know, an enormous amount of money, especially for an area that uh, traditionally has not been that well funded. The 300 million will go through EPSRC. I am a, a member of the uh, Mathematical Sciences Advisory Group at EPSRC who are looking at strategic advice for how best to invest that money. Uh, it's actually a coincidence that I'm president of the R Society. I'm not on that group as a, a in my capacity as president of the R Society, but uh, we 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 are you know looking very very carefully across all the mathematical sciences, uh, taking an interdisciplinary view as to how uh, that investment can be most effectively made. And as I've already mentioned, there 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 are, there are meetings. Uh, uh, being planned for the autumn, CMS-led meetings with EPSRC. So this is uh, an important piece of ongoing work uh, uh, 
foundations were laid in 2019, but it's very much ongoing. Uh, throughout the year, um, we had the, 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 web, the website launched, um, the AI task and finish group reported and board uh, accepted the recommendations, co-sponsored sponsored the Validate AI conference. Um, a number of external partnerships, uh, in particular um, with the um, chartered accountants, and I think that's uh, progressing really well. Had a computational modeling event with Bayes, which, which fits with our agenda to have more uh, effective engagement with government and policymakers. And in terms of um, the educational agenda, our proposal for level seven apprenticeships were approved. And there's a lot, lot of work went into that. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank the colleagues involved for, for, for that, because it really was a significant amount of work. Gavin, could we move on, please? Okay, so, so we, we launched the Women in OR and Analytics Network. Um, in my manifesto for the presidency of the society, I highlighted the importance of equality, diversity, and inclusion uh, in the activities of the society. Uh, it, it, it's great to see that this is happening and it's very much something that we want to focus on in the coming years. Uh, there was a joint bid for funding OR capacity building in Southeast Asia between the universities of Southampton and Kent, and that, that is ongoing. And we agreed uh, a set of values for the organization, for the society, rigorous, inclusive, proactive, and supportive. And I think they, though, those concepts do capture what the society represents. Gavin. Okay, so I won't read out these uh, the, 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 these slides, but needless to say, there were a significant number of events throughout 2019. It was very much as the, as the slide says, their business as usual. Most of these events. Uh, uh, have been affected, of course, by COVID. And uh, throughout this year, 2020, we have moved much of our activity online. Gavin, could we move on, please? Okay, so here's just a, a, a summary of, uh, of some of the activities of the society eight active regional societies, 11 special interest groups, and of course, our uh, journals and, uh, uh, and, and publications. The, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, th those were the awards in 2019, uh, Richard and, and Ailsa. Gavin, could we move on please? I think the, the key point on this slide is the number of members at just over 3,000. Uh, we do have a, a membership drive and are looking to, uh, to increase that. This does make us the second largest OR society in the world after INFORMS. And actually per member of population, I believe it makes us the largest. Gavin. So financials, well, I'm going to hand over to Gavin to talk through uh, uh, the financials, but I can uh, uh, certainly chip in if necessary. Gavin. Sure, sure. Yeah. The, um, the basic message from, from the uh, financials for the site for 2019 is that in terms of, uh, at least financially, we're very healthy. Uh, the total assets of the society are 2.4 million. Um, which is roughly the same as it was the previous year. Um, obviously, uh, the impact of COVID-19 since, since March has 
had a uh, uh, has altered that position a little, um, but I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about that as we come come to it. Um, our income went up uh, by over 100k on uh, 2018. Um, expenditure did too. Uh, for both good and bad reasons. Um, we made rather a sizable uh, deficit uh, overall on the uh, income and expenditure account of uh, £234,000, uh, which was an increase uh, from what should have been to 2018 there. And that was much bigger than um, we had budgeted for. And I'll come on to that a little bit further in a second. Um, in terms of uh, our income, obviously the major contributor there is our publishing con contract with Taylor and Francis. The income from that solidified um, was up by almost £80,000 over the previous year. But whilst we've got that contract in place until the end of 2022, there is still some, some risk associated with it uh, in terms of uh, various movements on open access and, and the likes of Plan S uh, and potentially the impact on um, university budgets uh, because of COVID-19. Um, actually 2020 is looking pretty healthy in terms of the publishing income but we're expecting that may be impacted in 2021. Obviously we're monitoring that very closely. Uh, our income from uh, events and conferences was up too, uh, but costs were too. Um, and one of our key learnings for, for the year is that um, our conference budgeting uh, needs to be uh, tightened up. Um, we saw part of the increase in, in events and conferences was, was due to us uh, adopting the ISMORE uh, defence-based conference. Um, which was uh, obviously a good thing for our overall portfolio. Um, training had another good year and repeated the, the uh, good performance of 2018. Um, so as I hinted at um, earlier on, our total funds remained at uh, 2.6 million despite making uh, a, a quite a big deficit on our operating account. Um, and overall, the deficit came to just under £10,000. Um, that operating deficit was all but overturned by the um, net gains on our investment portfolio over the year. Um, I think the important thing uh, to make here uh, is that the board have made it absolutely clear that lessons will be learned from the disappointing financial performance um in terms of both the budgeting itself and then the budget control as we move move through the year um and we've set a very clear target that 2020 should still return a surplus um uh, despite the impact of covid19 uh, and you're probably aware of one or two things that um, we've made decisions about to make sure that goes forward but I am pleased to say that that is all looking very positive um, and has helped us to, to maintain uh, the, our, much of our activities or switch it to online. Uh, and indeed all of the staff have remained working through the, through the period. We haven't had to resort to any furloughing. Uh, I have got some charts which, um, from which I'll pull out a couple of key messages and um, they're probably ones you're well familiar with. In terms of the income, this is the breakdown between uh, the main components and as you already know I'm sure publications accounts for a huge proportion of our income. Um, we're obviously taking steps to um, try and diversify and increase our income from other sources. Um, but of course, publications carries on improving its performance uh, and we seem to do really well out of that. You'll also note that training and events and conferences 
um, contribute a sizable chunk. Um, both of those will be um, severely impacted this year, 2020, through through COVID, ensuring that much of the activity is, is cancelled. The next slide looks at what we spend uh, that money on. Um, pattern pretty much following previous years, uh, not really uh, too much to, to bring out from that slide. And a, a breakdown of some of what we do with uh, some of the uh, other charitable expenditure that's away from our events and conferences and so on. Um, lots of good stuff going on in terms of um, OR in education, um, getting the word about OR out to schools and universities, the uh, pro bono work that's going on, and obviously doing a lot of work uh, publicizing um, what OR is and what it can do. Okay, um, in terms of the finance stuff, that's all I wanted to uh, talk about. Um, I suggest that we go through the, um, the voting session next, uh, if you don't mind, um, and then we'll have an opportunity for uh, a bit more chatting uh, towards the end of the session. So let me just press on with that. Um, if anyone does have a, a really pressing comment or question, I guess now is your opportunity to to make it. I'm going to take silence as, as my cue to go on. Um, so this is, the, I, I guess, what you call the formal um, part of the AGM. Um, this year, we're obviously doing things a little differently in that we are um, online. Um, and uh, the sort of legislation and guidance from Companies House and the Charity Commission um, indicate that we're allowed to do this sort of thing, even if it's not expressly uh, permitted in, um, not expressly permitted in, in terms of our constitution. Um, so you will all have had the opportunity to look at the various papers involved in the in the voting, such as the minutes and the um, uh, annual report, etc. Uh, the voting has been done electronically via the website and by post. Um, normally, we'd go through a process where the resolutions would be proposed and seconded by people at the meeting. Um, for simplicity, I've asked that John Hopes and Janet Williams uh, provide that for us for the uh, for today to save sort of trying to find relevant people. So I'm just going to run through the uh, resolutions in turn uh, and share with you the outcomes. Okay, first one was to approve the minutes of last year's uh, annual general meeting. Um, and we had a total of 57 votes. Uh, you can see the split between those for it, against, and those abstaining, uh, and that resolution was passed. Uh, resolution three was to approve the annual reports and accounts uh, for the year ending in December. Uh, again, solid voting in favour of that resolution, and that was passed too. Number four was to reappoint Mazars as our auditors. Uh, and again, that was past two. Um, and I'd just like to point out that we do have um, actions in place to go out to tender to uh, look for bids for providing uh, the next uh, auditors, the auditors after this one, um, which of course, could still come back to Mazars, but we're just checking to make sure we're getting good value for money there. Uh, resolution five was to increase the uh, annual subscription rates um, by a small amount, uh, guided by um, the CPI figure. 
Um, again, that was um, passed with 93% of the vote for it. Um, number six was to do with accreditation application fees. Uh, once again, that was passed with a substantial vote for. Resolution seven was to do with the um, prices charged for taking additional uh, print copies uh, of the journals. Uh, once again, passed comfortably. Number eight was uh, to do with uh, postage rates, sending out uh, copies of journals, etc. And again, that was passed with a substantial four vote. And finally, the last one was to do with uh, the rates that we charge for providing members with a hard copy of our MS today. Uh, and again, that was passed comfortably. Okay, so um, the next step um, really is for us to uh, throw this meeting open for comment, question, discussion uh, about uh, what the society has been doing, what it's up to currently and what you might like it to do in the future. Um, I've got a couple of, or one slide in particular that I can share, um, which discusses the um, strategic direction that the society's general counsel and board have uh, discussed uh, and set out in the latest version of its business plan. So perhaps I'll just run through that, um, which might give us a bit of context for any further discussion. Um, start with the objectives uh, this, that are set out in, in our um, Memorandum of Articles, our Constitution, uh, about the advancement of knowledge, interest and education in OR. They haven't changed. Um, but underneath that, um, we've agreed six uh, strategic pillars. Um, and because we're calling them pillars, I've made this diagram into a, an Acropolis-like building. Um, so we'll just pop up those six pillars. The first one's raised the aware awareness of importance of OR, and we've already talked about that to some extent uh, in the earlier presentation. Second one is to support uh, development of OR knowledge, um, support OR education, and again we've uh, talked a little bit about some of that earlier on. We want to grow our membership uh, and wider reach of the society. We want to ensure the society's uh, financial sustainability while we're doing that. Uh, and finally, again, something that Edmund mentioned earlier on, uh, we want to address diversity and inclusion uh, challenges in both the society and the wider OR community. Uh, and the final element of this uh, is uh, the sort of foundations for the building, uh, which we believe should be our, the values we've set out. Uh, and whilst they're the, only the headline terms shown on here, we do have uh, a lot of information uh, about what these, these means um, that we'll be sharing more widely in the future. Um, so it's at that point that uh, I'd like to pause in what I'm saying and open the floor up to you guys to uh, talk about this. Um, and momentarily, I'll stop, stop my screen sharing. Um, if we need to refer back to this slide, I can start that up again. Um, so let me just... Okay, so does anybody, anybody have any related comments or questions or... Can make an observation, um, Gavin, following on the what thinking about getting more people involved in OR. Um, I, 
have a, a, a granddaughter who actually attended a, one of our conference with, for, for 24 hours slice, sort of afternoon followed by morning, who really enjoyed herself, but her degrees are BAs and MA in um, history and politics and in international relations. And her sort of mathematical education stopped at GCSE level. But she, uh, my feeling is she's somebody who could John, you've muted yourself somehow. John, we can't hear you. There we go. Okay, that's me. Um, yeah, in, if, if you like, get the humanities people on board. Get, you know, there are people, bright ideas, um, because you think about it, a lot of the modelling that's been done around COVID, for example, has been to do with the sort of the, the dynamics of people and groups of people and their behaviour. And all sorts of people have views on that. And of course, we've got a, the, the danger we have is that all, too many people think that if you can't do some weird and wonderful maths, you can't do OR. Well, of course, the reality is we're very much involved in organizing groups of people to interact. And if the, the people management skills have much to do with the success they are as the actual juggling the numbers. Um, so we ought to think more about when we're educating people, how can we get OR thinking into the minds of people who are not necessarily bean counters? Yeah, absolutely uh, agree with what you're saying there. And um, much of the activity that we do uh, at a school level, for example, does uh, expand beyond just the obvious uh, entry points of, of maths and science. Um, so we go to a lot of uh, um, fairs, careers fairs, uh, at both school and university level, and we do um, we do talk to a lot of people about uh, OR and, and stress much of what you're you're mentioning. Uh, so yeah, we, we try to do that wherever possible. Thanks, thanks for that, John. A any other questions or comments? Go on, Lucy. You're muted. Oh, there we yeah, go. sorry. There we go. Um, I just wanted to ask about uh, the diversity and inclusion style um, plans that you've got, because um, lots of things have happened recently with like the Warren group, and that's fantastic. But there are a lot of other man minorities out there. So are there I don't know, plans in place going forward to try and reach out to uh, more people? Uh, absolutely. Now, I think Nicola is on the call or she was. Uh, Nicola is our Nicola Morell is our board champion on diversity, um, and we have uh, Fliss, who's our staff champion, if you like. Uh, Nicola, are you still around? Do you want to? I don't think she is. Um, well, let me let me try and and jump in. Unless Fliss wants to do so. This is unmuting. All right, yeah, I'll just share my video as well. Um, I think that, so there's, there's a massive programme which could be done with diversity and inclusion. I think probably just to say we're, although we're, we're part of the Science Council framework, we're still quite at the early stages of our journey with that. And something that Nick and I have been working on recently is just looking at where we actually are at that framework, reassessing where we're at and where we want to be. So at the minute, it feels a bit more like... Um, a checklist of what we need to achieve but actually what Nick and I are discussing is actually we, we need to decide what our ambition is and that's probably something we need to do with general counsel and that will link very much into what you're saying Lucy of actually are we looking at gender are we looking at ethnicity we need to decide which groups we are targeting and, and then look at what initiatives we can do to try and drive that forward. But certainly whenever we're talking about um, getting volunteers for the society's council and its very committees, speakers at events, etc., like that, we're 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 ensuring that uh, we're thinking um, with our sort of diversity and inclusion hats on. Um, 
yeah I'd just add to that I think like you say Gavin I think a lot of what the society has done has been implicit and a lot a lot of stuff has been done around diversity and inclusion we just need to formalize that a bit more to make it more obvious and then build upon that Thank you. Could I just think... add that at, at, at board level, we are very, very strongly committed to this agenda. It's an important uh, uh, part of the society's activities uh, as we go into the next few years. So it, it's critically important. Board are uh, very much engaged with this agenda and uh, determined to ensure that we do all we can. And in a sense, one of the um, ple more pleasant side effects of the COVID pandemic has meant that we have moved um, more of our material online and I think that's made it more accessible uh, for a wider group of, of people um, who perhaps wouldn't have been able to uh, attend a physical face-to-face -face meeting or training course. So, so we are making uh, steps or even strides to, to improving things there. Thank you. Any other questions? All gone quiet on you, John. Uh, can I just mention something? Since all gone quiet, following on the um, the things you said about the COVID, and, uh, Christine Curry was saying, Radio Four at the moment are running a series called the Political School, and which they're looking at ways in which our present government our, our governments should be educated and the things they ought to have been taught about things like you know handling numbers and so on and then how to talk to scientists which they of which they seem to be more or less totally ignorant in some cases and so that there are other things going on trying to bring our government more aware of the realities about them but um maybe we want to sort of think about like, making some of a contribution to some kind of program like that in the future as well, because a lot of people I think still do listen to the radio and um, it possibly, you know, something to be made aware of. And if you want to find out what's going on, you know, you think like the, the sound service from the BBC to pick up the programs and um, play them back and hear what it's all about. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, 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 thank you. I just want to say a few, a few words about, about 2020. Um, the, uh, I think the, the, the report this time next year will, will look very different. Um, the highlights of the 2019 report are, are that uh, um, uh, some financial challenges, but business as usual. The highlights of the uh, 2020 report will be serious financial challenges and certainly not uh, business as usual. Uh, the, we've already alluded to, to one or two things. Uh, they, we, we are expecting to deliver a surplus this fin uh, uh, for 2020. I think that is very, very important to protect the society, to protect uh, the cash reserves of the society in the significant uncertainty that, that we're in, uh, that, so that that it that will that is on track to be to be delivered, and board are very much committed to uh, to to addressing that. The activities of the society have uh, uh, changed significantly. Everything everything's moved online, and I would like to take this opportunity once again to thank uh, Gavin and Fliss and the team. I think the response of the society and the staff within the society has been absolutely outstanding in this pandemic Re really outstanding and we uh, owe them uh, uh, a debt of thanks we, we we really do so the challenges are immense as they are for all organizations but i think that uh, the staff are uh, are doing a great job and if we could do uh, take this opportunity to give them a, a, an electronic round of applause. Thank you, that's very kind. Okay. <laughs> Here you go. Thank, thank, that, thanks. Uh, so I don't have anything else to add um, from my perspective. Gavin, is there anything that you would like to add before I'll give, I'll give everyone the opportunity, to, is there, if there is any other business, but Gavin, is there anything you want to raise? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, 
other than to point people in the direction of, of, of the website to find details of everything that's going on. The webinar Wednesday series uh, has been tremendously successful, lots of interesting talks on there for which we've had really healthy numbers. Um, they're all um, available to watch if you miss them going out live. Um, look out for details of OR62 online. Um, again, we've talked a little bit about this earlier on. The conference will be uh, online in September, um, the week of the 14th uh, it is. The program should be, the detail, final details of the program should be announced uh, fairly soon. Um, but this year it will be free. Um, and we're hoping it'll, as, as we mentioned earlier, increase our, the attractiveness of people to get involved and to, to look in at uh, some or all of the, the content that's gonna be available. Um, and hopefully with our timings that should be available uh, in different time zones as, as well. And again, with the opportunity of catching up uh, with the recordings of, of the talks, uh, if you happen to have missed them. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, so before I close the meeting, any other business from anybody? Is it okay if I just uh, quickly pitch the ECR um, please, network please, event as well? So please. before OR62, there's going to be um, an ECR event for two hours on the 14th from 2 till 4 p.m. So if you've got PhD students that are coming up to the end, or you're an early career researcher yourself, um, do look out for advertisements for that as well, because uh, we're going to be trying to set up a network of um, early career researchers in OR. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, Lucy. I think Ruth was either waving at me or wants to talk. That, that too. I, I, I want to pitch something as well, uh, which is the Women in OR and Analytics Network. Uh, the summer event, we've had a, a monthly summer online programme, uh, which is aimed to be open to all, but particularly women. And we have an August event, which is very unusual um, to have an August event. And if you're not on holiday, it will brighten up your 13th of August on Thursday at 4 p.m. Uh, it's going to be six lightning talks from women who've uh, done something really interesting in OR. Of course, there are a lot of them. We had to narrow it down to six. One of them is Lucy. Um, and uh, it'll, be, it'll be really worth coming to. So please do try and come yourself. And if you can't come yourself, or even if you can come yourself, tell other people about it too. Thank you. And the beauty is, you can still watch it while you're on holiday because it's online. Absolutely. We don't know where you are when you join. Mm. No. Thanks, Ruth. And any, anybody with anything else? Okay, well, look, I'd like to finish by thanking you all for, for, for joining the meeting uh, and making it such a, 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 an engaging and interesting event. Thank you all very much indeed. Goodbye. Take care and stay safe. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank Cheerio. you. Bye everyone. Bye folks. Bye now.